Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this London Light seminar. So thank you very much for coming. Um, we have today very interesting speaker. Many of you know him very well, and I'm sure everyone can read many, many papers by Nadia Lungeta. And today he will tell us about 4D metaphotonics, and maybe he will tell us what future is for metamaterials and metaphotonics. So thank you very much, Nadia, for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, for me to be here. I want to thank my friend, Professor Anatoly Zayats, for his kind invitation and give me a chance to be here. And I have many friends, some of whom are in the audience, uh, in King's College and the other universities in London. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, as you can see from the title of my talk, I want to give an overview of uh, one of the areas of research activities in my group which deals with uh, four-dimensional metamaterial. And what do I mean by four-dimensional metamaterial? Uh, these are the structures that we would like to use to manipulate uh, waves uh, by actually structuring the material parameters, not only as a function of space, but also function of time. And as we go through this, you're gonna see that, of course, this will give you additional degrees of freedom and how we can actually utilize the degrees of freedom. But before I get to a specific uh, uh, topic that I'd like to talk about, I'm going to show you four slides first as just the background uh, material for this topic. So uh, we would like to deal with the interfaces, spatial interfaces and temporal interfaces. Now, we're all familiar, by the way, with the spatial interface. The simplest possible scattering problem in electromagnetics, of course, is the Fresnel problem that you have a flat interface between two semi-infinite medium that you know we teach to our undergraduates as a one item, as first item in electromagnetics. And of course, we know that the tangential component of magnetic field should be continuous and tangential component of electric field should be continuous when there is no uh, surface current density there. What is the dual of that in time? In other words, what is the equivalent of the temporal interface? Well, equivalent of that is the following. Imagine that you have an unbounded medium, and then you have a wave propagating in this unbounded medium, and at the t equal to t naught, you rapidly change the permittivity of this medium. That would be a temporal interface, and that temporal interface has its own boundary condition, which means the vector d has to be continuous just before and just after that temporal change of rapid change of permittivity, and also the vector B has to stay continuous. Now, why is it that in this case, the boundary condition in time, of course, is different than this? To get a little bit into that, let's go to the next slide and ask ourselves this question. Of course, we always follow Maxwell's equation and uh, we need to make sure that the spatial derivative is finite and the temporal derivative is finite. And of course, we know when the spatial derivative is finite, that's the boundary condition we have for spatial interface. But for the temporal interface, we need to make sure that dd dt and db dt stay finite just before and just after. And that's what vector d has to stay uh, continuous and vector b as much the same way. Now, vector d can be written in terms of epsilon dot e. So as a result, that would give you an idea about the temporal boundary condition we need to have. As a footnote, I'd like to point out that the way of writing like this is an approximation, because strictly speaking, vector D should be written in terms of E in the form of convolution, because you have to have a dispersion in the material. The topic of dispersion is not part of my talk today, but we have studied, by the way, the dispersion of the temporal material, and we found out, of course, dispersion plays a very important role. However, if the resonant frequency of your material is far away from the operating frequency that you have in your signal, it is approximately okay to write this expression, which usually we write epsilon e in frequency domain, but with that assumption, it's okay to write it this way. In other words, so-called the dispersion-less approximation. And for the rest of my talk, this is my assumption, meaning that the resonant frequency of the material is far away from the operating frequency. Now, 
there's an interesting relationship between the frequency and wave vector when we compare spatial interface with the temporal interface. In the spatial interface, again, very well known problem for all of us is that when you send a wave over here, the refracted wave would have the same frequency as the incident one for linear media, obviously, but the wave vectors are not the same. So K1 is different than K2, so different wavelengths because different index of refraction. However, for the temporal interface, just the other way is the case. In other words, if you have a monochromatic signal propagating in your unbounded medium, and at T equal to T naught, you rapidly change permittivity, what stays in you know, all conserved is the momentum. K1 is the same as K2, meaning the wavelength will stay the same, but the frequency of the wave will change. So this is a quite in interesting difference between these two scenarios we have there. So we need to keep in mind, and for the rest of my talk, I often refer to this condition, that when you have a temporal interface, Omega one square root of mu one epsilon one should be, stay the same as omega two square root of mu two epsilon two. Now, as a result of that condition, what would happen is that if you start with the monochromatic wave propagating in our unbounded medium with the wave vector K one and original frequency omega one, when at T equal to T naught, you rapidly change permittivity, that splits into two waves. One of them is forward going, the other one is backward going. And you notice, by the way, the forward and backward going has the same K1 over here, but the frequency is not the same. You have omega 2 because you have to satisfy that condition you mentioned. Now, these two coefficients that you see over here have been stud studied by several authors in the past. And these coefficients look like this that you can find in these references and other, other investigators also look at this expression. This is for the case that you rapidly change permittivity. Later on in my talk, we're going to see what would happen if you gradually change permittivity over here. One, so this essentially is the temporal equivalent of the Fresnel reflection and transmission coefficient, however, with a big difference. And the big difference is when you square this plus you square this, this sum is not equal to one because the electromagnetic energy is not conserved over here because you make an action on the medium. And that action can change the energy of electromagnetic signals before and after that change. Just to give you an idea, this is a simulation that my collaborator, Victor Pacheco Pena, has done just to show you what happens as this wave packet goes, when you rapidly change, you notice one go forward, the other one go backward with different phase velocities. And that's why the frequency will change, but the wavelengths stay the same. You notice that the wavelengths stay the same because K is the same, but not frequency. OK, so this is the background. So we have to deal with spatial interface and temporal interface. <clears throat> I've been inspired, by the way, by a quote by Herb Cromer. Herbert Cromer, who was a Nobel Prize in physics 2000, in his Nobel lecture, he has a very interesting statement in that lecture. In that lecture, he says, the interface is the device. Now, why did he say that? Because he won the prize for semiconductor heterostructures, showing that different layer of semiconductor material with different band gaps can have a, quite a fascinating properties. So indeed, he, in his field, interface was the device. So I like to argue, by the way, that these temporal interfaces and spatial interfaces are actually most of the interesting physics happens there. Incidentally, just several decades before Herbert Cromer, there was another famous scientist also talked about this condition, and that is Wolfgang Pauli. says, God made the, ball, made the ball, surface was invented by the devil, because most of the challenges and difficulties come from the surface. Okay, now, so that's a quick background with respect to the spatial versus temporal interface. But what would happen if you combine these two together? We have been interested to actually look at the merger of the spatial boundary and temporal boundary. This is a collaborative work with the Professor Matthias Fink and Mario Junior Mencogli, who was my postdoc. Now he's an assistant professor in University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and our collaborator, Dimitrius Sonas. And, uh, and there's another part that actually the collaboration with Victor Pacheco Peña, which I will present. So let's start with this first problem first. So one of the things we were interested uh, is that uh, what would happen if we start with the body of a material, let's say epsilon one, in the static scenario, 
So this static scenario, you have electrostatic field over here. And obviously, of course, you see there's a spatial boundary over here. And what would happen at t equal to t naught? You rapidly change the epsilon one to another epsilon over here. So you're creating a temporal boundary in the presence of a spatial boundary. What would happen to the wave then? So we decided to study this problem. And obviously, of course, that gave rise to a dynamic field, so we wanted to study that. Now, why we were interested in this? Matthias Fink was uh, visiting me for a couple of days. This was just before the pandemic. And over dinner, we were talking about it. He said, you know, would it be interesting if we actually use the temporal variation of a material to actually transform the energy near the antenna and make it going to the far field? So however, somehow we do this, you know, energy transformation between the near field of antenna to the far field. I said, well, that's a very interesting point. Let's do work this together. So we decided to start from the static scenario because the field distribution near the antenna resembles the field distribution in static, although of course it's dynamic. So we decided to study this. So together with Mario and Demetrius, we changed the problem to this problem. By the way, this font here did not work out. There's some fonts here, but essentially this is the epsilon of T here over here. So we decided to simplify the problem with a one dimensional problem, parallel plate structure, and there's a voltage VC connected to this. And this region of a dielectric, we're gonna change in time. And of course, by symmetry, that means we have to solve the half of this problem, which is symmetric with the other half. It turned out that uh, we were able to solve this problem analytically exactly using Laplace transform. I don't want to bore you with the detail of the mathematics, but let me just show you actually the results that what happened over here. Before I show you the plot, there's an interesting effect you see over here. This is summation over here, and this summation is the step function, and this gamma is essentially the reflection coefficient at this boundary. So what happens is by changing this permittivity, you create a wave that bouncing back and forth between these boundaries naturally, and every time it bounces, the radiation leaks out to the outside of that. The reason we were interested, so there were several reasons, but one of the important reasons we were interested is what happens to this boundary? Because this is a spatial boundary, which means tangential component of E has to be continuous, but at the same time is a temporal boundary which means vector D has to be continuous in time. So how do we reconcile these two boundary conditions at the same location? And this actually gave us the answer. In other words, we were able to exactly solve this problem. So what you see over here is distribution of the electric field at different moments in time as a function of Z that you see over here. So you notice there's an outgoing wave, there's a backward going wave. This one hits the other boundaries coming back. So there's a multiple reflection there. So what would happen if we sit just this side of the boundary and just that side of the boundary? What kind of boundary condition do we see there? This is the result of that. So imagine that you're sitting at point 0.9L, L being the length of this dielectric, you're just this side of it, and another one of us sit just the other side of it, and this would be the distribution of the field as a function of time. You notice there's a little difference over here between these two, and this is because we are not exactly on the boundary. So when we come exactly on the boundary like this, everything coalesces together. So the temporal boundary condition and spatial boundary condition have to be satisfied naturally as they should. But this is because, of course, the combination of all the waves that's happening there. So this was our, our early study just to get a feel for this one. So we decided to extend this concept to see what other interesting things we can do over here. So now that we understand what happens in the merger of the two boundaries, can we use it? Can we use something for that? So that's why we decided to look at the manipulating wave with combination of spatial and temporal boundaries. So I'm gonna show you four scenarios of merging the temporal and spatial boundary. Let's start with scenario one. And as I mentioned, this is a collaborative work with Matthias Fink and my longtime collaborator, Victor Pacheco Pena, who is now at Newcastle University in UK. Scenario one. Scenario one is the following. Imagine that you have an unbounded medium, uniform, and you have a wave propagating to here, a monochromatic wave. But now you would like to actually change the permittivity of this medium, but not the way we were doing it before. What we want to do is we want to have two different regions that first, the, all the epsilon is the same, but at t equal to t naught, the changes in these two regions will be different. 
So in a sense, you use the temporal boundary to create the spatial boundary. And in this case, a spatial boundary happens to be normal to the direction of propagation. What do we expect to see? Well, what we expect to see is that at, at the moment that we make these changes, the K or the wavelength will be the same. But because the epsilons are different, that means the frequencies will be different. So even though originally we had the same frequency, but at that moment, we're going to create two different frequencies with the same wavelength. But then the temporal boundary is done, but the spatial boundary is still there. So that wave starts to propagate, and when it gets to the other medium, it's going to have a different wavelength as well. So you're going to have a very interesting merging of changing the frequency and changing the wavelength that you go through this. So I'm going to show you a simulation that Victor has done over here. Let me see if I can do it here. So you notice, uh, I'm going to see this one. The wave is propagating monochromatic wave, and then at that t equal to t naught, see what happens. At the moment that happens, you notice the wavelength stay the same, frequency changed, but that frequency continues to go into the other medium. So when it goes to the other medium, the wavelength would be different because now we are dealing with the spatial boundary. Originally, we start with the temporal boundary, create spatial boundary, but then frequency and wavelength will change. Let's look at it one more time because then we're going to actually make this more layers. So this coming like this. At that moment, the wavelength stays the same, frequency changes. And then when this different frequency come into this, the wavelength will change. So if the observer sits over here, what does that observer see? So in order to understand that, let's go to scenario number two. Scenario number two is using the same thing, but multiple layers. So again, we start with the uniform field, a uniform uh, material. We have a monochromatic wave going through that. At t equal to t naught, we would like to actually change the permittivity of each of this region differently. In that case, you're going to have different frequency generated in all of these, and then all of these start to move. When it goes to the other medium, the wavelengths will change. So, in that case, you notice that at different location in space, you're going to create different frequencies. So, this is a very interesting, actually, frequency modulations which I'm going to show you later on. We can take advantage of it. But before I show you the result, do we have an interesting analogy in this in space? Let me take you completely to a different topic for the next slide and come back to this. We all know, by the way, that the metasurfaces have been, you know, very, very uh, um, popular. Uh, these are two examples of work by like Federico Capasso's group and Shalayev and Baltasebo's group. And what, one of the interesting features about this work is that by putting a metal surface on this surface between two media, and by designing these elements of this metal surface inhomogeneously, they were able to actually engineer the value of the uh, tangential component of wave vector here. So you notice the incident wave coming all parallel, so tangential component of wave vector is the same, but when it goes to the other side of the medium, the tangential component of wave vector will be different. And by that engineering, a parallel beam can become, for example, a focus beam. And these are one of the very interesting application of metal surfaces. So you notice you start with the same K sub X, you end up with different K sub X at different location. What I'm going to show you in the next slide is a temporal version of that. We start with the same frequency, with a different location in space, then you have different frequencies. So let's take a look at it. So imagine we have this 10, 10 regions. These 10 regions, originally, they have the same permittivity and permeability. And then at t equal to t naught, we're going to change the permittivity of these regions or permeability of this region differently. How are we going to do that? So imagine we start epsilon all 10. So this is a uniform region. But then at t equal to t naught, uh, layer 1 and layer 10 suddenly changes from 10 to 1. And layer 2 and layer 9 changes from 10 to 3, and so on and so forth. So most of the changes at the boundary and then less in the middle. So what do we expect to see? You're going to expect to see that the wave in this region has a different frequencies, different, different, and then you have a very interesting set, and this would be for the mu as well. So let's take a look at this simulation. The wave is coming monochromatic, and then that thing happened. 
you're going to notice that there's a lot of interesting interaction happens in that region. But what's important is what observer sees over here. You notice that the observer sees over here a very interesting signal that's coming with the high frequency first, less and less and less, and then more and more and more. Why? Because you did change more the epsilon of layer one, layer 10, compared to the layer five and layer six that you did that. But that was under your control. I mean, you could have done it in any combination you want. So what happens is you can actually have a very interesting way of engineering the chirp signal. In other words, you can chirp the signal with one action of the material over here. So if we look at the what observer would see at this point, you're going to get something like this over here. So you notice, by the way, here, the frequency at different location is different. And that's why I was mentioning to you, so it's a temporal analog of this case. In this case, at different location, you have different k sub x. In our case, at different location, you have different frequencies. Now, that was your choice to change layer 10 and layer, uh, layer 1, layer 10 from 10 to 1. You could have done it in any different combination you want. For example, in the next slide, we're going to do it the other way. So start all of them with the same permittivity, but layer 1, layer 10 changes from 10 to 9, whereas the layer in the middle changes most from 10 to 1. In that case, lower frequency happens over here and higher frequency in the middle, and any combination you want. So let's take a look at this one. So now, what comes out over here, you're going to see at the beginning is a lower frequency, but at the signal propagates become high frequency. So you can actually engineer a different, uh, I mean, chirp signal that you would like to have, as you can see over here. So let's go to scenario number three. Scenario number three is the following. You start with a uniform medium again, just like what we did before. You have a monochromatic wave going through over here, but now, when we want to change the permittivity, we want to change it in these two regions. So in other words, using a temporal interface, you create a special interface that's parallel with the direction of propagation. What do you expect to see? Well, before I show you the result, let's find out what we need to do. At first, the medium is the same, so omega is omega and k is k. But when you do this change, k1 should be equal to k2. That's the condition I mentioned to you before. Which means the frequency of the wave on the top will be different than the frequency of the wave at the bottom after you make that change. But then we know the indices of refraction will be different, which means the phase velocity of the two waves will be different. So what happens at the boundary? So you have a single wave is coming, and suddenly you create two regions. In this region, the wave starts propagating with different speed. How would you satisfy the boundary condition at the boundary between this? You start with a single frequency, single wave number, then now you have two different frequencies, single wave number, but different phase velocity. Well, let's see what happens. Now, notice what happens at this boundary, eventually now not. Even though the wave originally was going over here is completely uniform in this direction, by creating this electromagnetic shear effect, so to speak, you make the boundary over here becoming zero field eventually. But you notice something quite interesting. You notice that there is some interesting wave propagating you know, obliquely over here. And why is that? Because this wave that's propagating, one medium is denser than the other medium, so that wave starts to leak out that we're just kind of like a refractive phenomenon with the wave being parallel with the boundary. And as this thing is leaking out, because that wave is going with a different speed, eventually the field has to be zero because it cannot satisfy boundary condition with two different non-zero values because they have different speeds. This reminds us, by the way, another interesting phenomenon that goes back almost 40 years ago. And this was a paper that I wrote 40 years ago. And this was part of my PhD work that I did at Caltech. And at that time, the interest was on mon mon monolithic microwave integrated circuits. What happens if you put an antenna at the interface between two media? And that was a hot topic in those days because that technology was being developed at that time. 
And the idea was that if I put an antenna between two different medium, how does this actually antenna radiate? And it turns out that when we solve this problem, this would be the radiation pattern that you get. Obviously, you have null along the boundary because the two waves cannot propagate with the different speeds. And one of the interesting uh, finding that I had in those days is that you notice, obviously, most of the energy going into denser medium. Now it's a very well known concept. In those days, it was just, you know, uh, at the beginning of this. And also, you notice the peak directions actually is not the 90 degree direction, it's a specific direction you have. And by the way, this actually is one of the phenomena of the high, uh, I mean, subsurface radar imaging that when you put an antenna on the boundary and the most of the energy go down. So you notice this direction, that's the peak of the radiation pattern, is actually, that's exactly the direction of that oblique wave that you saw in the previous slide. So in order to see this better, we're going to repeat that simulation, but only with one cycle of the wave. Let's see what happens. I think I have to start it. So this is going like this, and then see what happens. You see you have a forward wave going, you have a backward wave going, and you notice what happens at this point. This is the oblique wave that I was telling you about. The leakage that's happened and guarantees that the field along here becomes zero. So this, so this essentially becomes the temporal version of what I showed you in the standard spatial you know, antenna on the interface case. Okay, very good. Now that we know what happens at the single boundary of this parallel, so-called the shear effect in electromagnetics, let creates several boundaries. What do you expect to see over here? Originally, is a wave in a single medium. Then at t equal to t naught, you create this different layer in time. So this start moving with a different speed in each layer of that. At the boundary, they have to leak out to the other boundary that you have there. So what do you expect to see? Let's see. Now, see what happens. And you notice, by the way, this wave coming over here creates a focal line and then again diverge. That's going through. What does this actually remind us? What is the spatial I mean, I mean, analogy of this one. The special analogy, let's do it again. See, it's coming over here and become a focal line and then diverges again. So something becoming like a focal line and diverges again. How, what does that remind us? Remind us of a converging lens. This is the special case, and this is actually temporal phenomena of that. So here you notice, by the way, different segments of this have a different path length. Of course, that's why we have focal point, obviously. But this happens entirely at the same aspect. So as a result, temporally, this comes over here. So rather than having a focal point, you have a focal line. And the same way that here, when you have a focal point, is diverges, the same thing is happening over here. So you can actually essentially create a four-dimensional lens. So this is effectively a four-dimensional lens. You're bringing the wave closer to each other, but you can do it the entire wave. You don't need to have a point. So it's quite interesting to see, you know, what would happen in the focal We don't have a focal length over here. This actually becomes a focal line. We have it. So scenario number four is when we have an oblique case. So imagine we have an unbounded medium that we have over here. Again, same story, we have a, a, a uniform uh, monochromatic wave. But this time, when I want to change the permittivity, I want to change the permittivity in this arbitrary shape. What would you expect to see? So obviously, when I change this thing, the frequency here be different with the frequency there. Wavelength would be the same. But then this wave with the different frequency is going to hit this spatial boundary that we have there. So depending on that angle, you can play around Quite interesting phenomenon. Let me show you only one example over here. So let me again start this. So now, you see what happens. We intentionally make this thing such that when this, thing, this boundary happens, this becomes greater than critical angle. So then you have a total internal reflection. You have the original wave with a single frequency, single wavelength. You make this change, 
the wave in this side would not change, continue propagating. The wave in the other side will have a different frequency, but that special boundary is there now, and this is actually greater than a critical angle. So the things bounce back. So you can imagine by just controlling this system, you can actually split your wave. You can basically modulate your wave you want and also can do it in space. So these examples that I showed you tell us that the, we can actually do interesting frequency modulations. But those of you in electrical engineering are very familiar with frequency modulation in electronics. But what's the difference between this frequency modulation and the one in electronics? Well, the frequency modulation in electronics that you're all familiar with is that you start with a cosine or sinusoidal function, and then you try to change the frequency of that signal. If you do that, and if you look at the Fourier transform of that, you notice that you have a sideband, inevitably. So you start with the carrier frequency, and you have these sidebands. And often, these sidebands are actually uh, undesirable, because you would like to do this frequency modulation, and you want to get rid of some of the sidebands over here. But with this technique that we are talking about over here, you don't have a sideband. You just get the modulation you want. Why? Because if you start with a monochromatic signal, you notice the big difference, by the way, here is in electronics, this is not a function of Z. This is just a signal as a function of time. So when you change, modulate the frequency, you just have to expand that in terms of you know, a system you have. But this is also a function of Z, so it's a wave. So you do that on the material, on the medium. And when you do that in the medium, it happens in all of those points. And because it happens in all of those points, all cooperatively work together and give you only one single frequency output. Because if you start with this, as we showed before, omega 2 is different than omega 1. And the expression of omega 2 versus omega 1 is this formula. So you notice you actually would have only one uh, I mean, main frequency you have. I was talking to two colleagues of mine in electrical engineering in, in electronics, and they actually noticed something interesting. They said, well, in this type of modulation, you don't need carrier. So in other words, you start with the original signal, you can actually move it to another signal you want. So this is actually, in that sense, very different than the standard frequency modulation we have. So uh, with Victor, uh, we decided to theoretically study this as a potential future device. So we said, okay, if that's the case, if I have original signal coming over here, can I send it to a ring resonator? And while that wave is in the ring resonator, you change the cladding of this. When you change the cladding, you can change the frequency of that. When you do that, let it go back and couple to another one. These two with the same material, except you have to design this waveguide slightly differently in order to make sure the reflection here is minimized. So you change, start with F0, you get to F1, when the F1 comes over here, you do exactly the same thing again. You get to F2, you bring it over here, do it again, you get to F3. And this change of materials are all the same, except you step by step increase the frequency that you have. So you can have a very interesting device that you can actually control the frequency the way you want it in the same set of design. So let me show you this uh, simulation. So the waves coming over here, when it's inside, then you change this, this case, the frequency changes, you come over here, then you rapidly change this one, you come over here, and now you change that one. So the frequency step by step come up. So, so this, I told you that would be a, a, a way to actually look at the frequency modulation in a completely different way, because you deal with the wave rather than the signal at the given uh, I mean, position in circuits. It's actually a wave there. OK, so that's for frequency. But how about amplitude? Can we actually also have amplitude modulations? Well, for that, let me take you back to the slide I showed you earlier at the beginning of my talk, one of the background slides I showed you. I mentioned that if you start with a monochromatic signal as a wave, then when you do that variation with the epsilon, you're going to get the forward wave and backward wave, back, forward wave and backward wave. And the magnitude of the forward and backward wave depends, of course, on the permittivity. But this is under the assumption that you change epsilon rapidly. Practically, that may not be that possible, depending on the frequency of operation. But what if you change the per per permittivity slowly? In that case, what kind of, I mean, backward and forward magnitude do you get? Well, 
it's interesting, by the way, that this actually studied by, uh, I mean, uh, Andrew Alou's group and uh, Emmanuel Galifi, uh, one of his postdocs, which of course was from you know, Imperial College, Ricardo, you know him very well. So what they did, they did a beautiful job over here. So they started with this monochromatic one and they said, okay, what if the epsilon rather than rapid variation will be just arbitrary variation with time? Is there any way that we can actually find out what is the magnitude of the backward wave? And indeed, they did a beautiful job over here to actually solve this problem, and you end up with this Riccati type equations. And this Riccati type equation actually gives you the value of r as a function of t. So indeed, this could be an interesting you know, technique that if you want to have special magnitude of the backward wave, you can work it backward to find out what epsilon as a function of time you need to have. So that will give you not only variation on the frequency, but also variation of the amplitude. So that's one way of doing that. Another way of doing that is by actually amplification. My friend Matthias Fink has studied the issue of Faraday instability in, in mechanics. So if you actually change, I mean, start changing the material with a certain frequency, then under certain condition, you can actually amplify the magnitude of the signal. And this is known as Faraday instability, and Matthias has studied that extensively. Recently, Moti Segev and his group applied this concept of, uh, I mean, parametric amplification or, or, uh, or Faraday instability to show theoretically that indeed you can amplify emission from an excited system and having lasing in photonic time crystals. Well, we have another idea, by the way, uh, for controlling this amplitude and amplification. And that idea that I'm going to uh, talk to you about is based on the concept of non-foster structures. Now, we started actually we work on this problem almost three, four years ago. And in fact, we even designed uh, a circuit, uh, I mean, transmission line that we want to experimentally verify that with the collaboration with the colleague I, I have in electrical engineering. But then we hit the pandemic and his lab closed down, and then after it was open, the post site that he was working on left, you know, and so on and so forth. So that plan went on the shelf. But recently, we actually find new theoretical results, so we resurrected that idea. So I'm going to tell you what that idea is. But before I do that, you may wonder, what is the non-foster structures? So what is the non-foster structure? Well, before I tell you what's a non-foster structure, I have to tell you what's the foster structures. So let's talk about foster. Structure. Almost 100 years ago, in 1924, almost 100 years, Ronald Foster at Bell Laboratory came up with a very interesting theory. What he said is that imagine that you have a network of collection of passive, uh, collection of reactive elements in circuits, meaning a collection of inductor and capacitors, let's say no resistor, or very, very small loss. What he said is that if you have this arbitrary connection of these capacitors and inductors there, and look through this network and look at the input impedance of this system, you can write the input impedance of this system in terms of R plus Jx, which by the way, R is very small, assuming this is lossless or very low loss, but the X is essentially the reactive reactance of the system you have. It. What he found out, by the way, that for passive structures, this function x as a function of frequency can be written in terms of the ratio of two polynomial whose poles and zeros alternate each other. And what that means, by the way, is that if you look at the function x as a function of omega, the derivative of that with respect to frequency has to be positive. There's no other way. For passive structure, there's no other way. That's known as foster reactance theory. By the way, as a footnote, uh, because he was electrical engineer, he's using e to the j omega t as time convention. So let's keep that in mind. Because if it's e to the minus i omega t, that sign would flip. But anyway, that's a side issue. So he showed that this has to be positive. And that's, of course, very well the case in many systems. For example, if you look at a capacitor, 1 over j omega c, you notice this slope is positive. Or if you look at the inductor, L omega, this will be positive there. 
So all the passive circuit element reactive part, not the, not the resistor, let's put that aside, follows this. In the material media, by the way, the same thing applies. Obviously, this is a very general theorem. So if you have any passive medium and you look at the susceptibility of that medium, this derivative has to be positive. And that's one of the reasons when you look at Lorentzian distribution, you look at the Drude distribution, all followed this one. Okay. It turns out that the, if one can ask this question, can we actually make the system non-foster? Is it possible to break that? And this was a question of interest to electrical engineers and circuit designers back in 1950s, almost 50, 60, 70 years ago. Why they were interested in that? The question is this one. If we can have an element like a negative capacitor, if we can have an element like negative capacitor, what would be the impedance of that? The impedance of that would be 1 over minus j omega c, which means this slope would be negative, and that's against the Foster reactance theorem. Is this possible? They asked that question at that time. And in order, to, why was it interested for them? Because if you have such a system and you can connect it in an antenna, you can actually match the antenna over a good range of frequency. And that's very important, by the way, in antenna design. It turns out that in order to do that, you have to have a system known as NIC, negative impedance converter. But what is this negative impedance converter? Which means if you put a regular load over here and you have this negative impedance con con uh, converter, the input impedance is minus A multiplied by this, which means what? Which means if you have a passive structure over here, what you see over here, you have this. But what does that mean? That means you have minus R minus JX, which means you have gain. So it is possible to have a non-foster system if you have a gain structure. You have to pump it. You cannot do it with the passive medium. And indeed, in 1950s, for example, Linville came up with this design. Two amplifiers next to each other with a regular load over here. The input impedance of this becomes like this. So you notice that the Z in is the negative of a constant multiplied by ZL. This has to be a gain medium. There's no other way around it. So with that in mind, we ask this question, will it be possible to have non-foster structures that we can do this? And can we change that in time? So that was a question we posed about three, four years ago. So the idea is this. If I want to change the permittivity of a medium from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, can I make epsilon 2 negative for the wave that's propagating inside of this? Remember that I have to make sure this condition is satisfied. It's a must. So imagine that I have a regular medium with epsilon 1 positive, and I have a wave propagating with frequency omega 1, mu positive, epsilon positive, and that's a regular plane wave. And then at t equal to t naught, I want to make epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, and I want epsilon 2 to be negative. One thing for sure, I cannot do that with the passive medium. That's an impossibility, as I mentioned, with the foster reactance theory. But let's assume if we can do it with a gain medium, what do we expect to see over here? Because this condition has to be satisfied, if epsilon 2 is negative, that means the square root is purely imaginary, which means omega 2 has to become purely imaginary. Now, what does that mean, if omega 2 being purely imaginary? That means the two forward wave and backward wave I was telling you about before, now in this case, this omega 2 has to become purely imaginary, which means what? Which means they're not waves anymore. They grow in time and they decay in time. Now, that's interesting because we start with a wave, and if we can bring epsilon 1 rapidly to epsilon 2, and epsilon 2 is negative, and I have to force it to keep it at epsilon 2 negative. Naturally, a natural medium cannot do that. To force it, that means that wave actually freezes. And two portion of that, one part grows in time, the other one decays in time. Now, before I show you the, the result, you may ask, well, why can I not do this with the passive medium? Well, let's see whether we can do it with the passive medium or not. Let's assume we take a Drude material. Okay, you're familiar with the Drude material here. So let me assume I start with omega p0 and I have free space or simple medium. 
and I operate with the frequency omega one. Okay, a wave is going through this. Now, I want to make this epsilon negative. What do I need to do? I need to bring a lot of polarizable particle into the medium, which means I have to bring the number density up. So omega p has to become up. Would be nice if I can bring omega p larger than omega. In that case, epsilon becomes negative. Okay. Remember, I start with this. Then I want this omega epsilon to be negative, which means omega p should be greater than this. However, as soon as I do that, I don't have omega 1 anymore because omega will change. Why? Because I have to satisfy this condition. So now I have a new omega, which is called omega 2. So what happens if I put omega 2 over here? OK, I have this one there. Is this positive or negative? Well, in order to answer that question, I have to make sure this is satisfied. If you get this one and combine it with this, you get this expression. You notice that omega 2 has to be larger than omega p. So epsilon 2 stay positive. It's an impossibility. You cannot do it with the passive medium. So that's why we need to actually go with the gain structure. We have to actually bring energy into the system. So, so let's take a look at this. OK. So with that in mind, let's go back to a plane wave that we had. Frequency omega 1, wave number k1 prop propagating in the x direction. With epsilon 1, at t equal to t1, I force this to be epsilon 2 negative. And again, I use the word force. You have to actually do it with energy pumping into the system. What would happen to the result? We have to make sure this is satisfied. This is the analytical result. So I don't want to bore you with the derivation of this. This is the analytical result that we have. Please take a look at this. This is quite interesting. This is an electric field and this is a magnetic field that comes out of this after you make this change. But please take a note. Time only appears here. This is just a parameter T1. That's the time that we did the change. So you notice time, time you know, varying time doesn't appear over here. This is only function of x. Function of time appears over here, but it's not sinusoidal. It's exponentially growing. This and this. So then this is exponentially decaying in time. So this, these are not waves. The waves are frozen. These are not propagating anymore. So we had a propagating wave, and by bringing this to epsilon 2, we actually freeze this wave. Now, if you look at the analytical expression and just plot it over here, this plot actually shows us what's happening. So imagine I plot uh, the electric field, the magnetic field, and the pointing vector x versus time. If I play x versus time, before I make this change, this is a standard plane wave that's going. At t equal to t naught, I make this change. You notice the wave freezes. Now, this magnitude is quite large. That's why we had to choose different scale in order not to saturate it. So essentially, this value over here is the same as this one and then grows exponentially that you see over here for the magnetic field and for the pointing vector that you see there. OK, so take a look at the field. This is electric field, this is magnetic field, this is pointing vector just before this change. If you just look at it as a function of x at this given moment in time, which is before this change, you notice electric field and magnetic field are in unison, in phase. Naturally, this is a simple plane wave. And pointing vector, you notice, obviously, never negative, and it's always have average non-zero. But what would happen if we just go to the other side? If we go to the other side after this change, this is your electric field, this is your magnetic field. You notice that there are like 90 degrees, you know, shift in space. So as a result, it looks like the pointing vector positive and negative. But it looks like that. Now, this is actually a very interesting puzzle that we solved just recently. And I'm going to show you the result. Even though it looks like the space average pointing vector is zero for this frozen wave, actually it's not. And you know why it is not, which I will tell you why. The reason that this actually is a very interesting hidden physics that happens over here. Now, before I get to that one, let's go and complete the picture. So let me assume I bring it down. I hold it at epsilon 2 negative. The field grows while it's frozen. And then, OK, when it gets to the proper amplitude I want, I change it back to positive. When I change it back to positive, it starts to propagate. But this time, I have two waves that propagate forward and backward. And 
take a look at this. So now you, know, you see this is a propagating wave because T and X appears over here. This exponential term is not changing with time anymore. It's just at two time, T1 and T2. So it gives me at what magnitude I want to stop and continue. So it's just like uh, the terminology I like to use is this one. It's just like, you know, you're going to the gas station to get a car. You go walk in that, you stop, you fill up the gas and you go. So this wave is coming, you freeze it, amplitude grows to the point you want, and then you let it go. But in that case, you have to go both ways. And you're going to see the effect of this. Okay. This is the picture that you see over here. So plane wave coming low over here, freezes over here, grows, and you let it go. When you let it go, it looks like two waves going opposite to each other, kind of like a standing wave. But here's an interesting point. It is not an exact standing wave, and I'm going to prove that for you. It looks like standing wave, but it's not exactly standing wave, and that's a must because of conservation of momentum. So we'll see what happens over here. So one thing is for sure, we have to make sure that the momentum is conserved. So when I have a plane wave coming like this, D cross V would be a momentum density that we have for that electromagnetic wave. So Minkowski momentum that we have over here. But when we change epsilon one to epsilon two negative, we just said that the wave freezes. So if the wave freezes, if the wave freezes, what happens to the momentum over here? Well, we studied this and we found out something quite interesting. If you look at the electric field of this term that's growing and look at its magnetic field that's growing, if you actually take a look at this and look at the pointing vector of this, as a function of space, you notice that the space average of that pointing vector is zero. Because you notice that it's just like a 90 degrees shift in space. If you do the same thing, by the way, for the decaying one, the same thing for that. For the growing one, the space average pointing vector is zero. For the decaying one, the space average pointing vector is zero. But is the space average pointing vector for the sum zero? No. That's an interesting thing. In other words, if you actually calculate this thing in its totality, the term is not zero. So it's interesting. The one that grows by itself, the space average pointing vector is zero. The one that decays by itself, the space average pointing vector is zero. But we should not actually treat them individually. We should treat them all together. When you treat them all together, the space average of the total field is not zero. And that's the way it should be because that guarantees the conservation of momentum. So even though this looks like the wave is frozen, there is still a net pointing vector in D cross B that we have there. What does that remind us of, by the way? There is very interesting analogy in space consideration of that. We all know, by the way, if you have two regular medium with the epsilon negative in between and you send the wave through it, the wave inside that is evanescent. We all know that. That evanescent wave doesn't have any point time average pointing vector. But when we have two of them, one decaying like this, the other one decaying like that, the presence of both, each one of them time average pointing vector is zero, but not the presence of both of them. In that case, you have a tunneling effect of the pointing vector goes from left to right. The phenomena that we have over here is a temporal version of that. So the growing one in time grows, the decaying one in time decays, each one of them looks like the space average pointing vector is zero, but both of them together, they're not. So you might say, how is it possible that I have E and H that is 90 degrees shifted in space and they don't have pointing vector non-zero? It's because of this. What happens is we decided to actually look at the phase difference between E and H in space. It turns out that when you start this change, what happens is E and H are in phase. But as you go, the E and H start to move towards 90 degrees. But as that happens, amplitude grows. So in the limit, when this goes to a 90, the amplitude is infinite. That combination guarantees that the space average pointing vector of the sum is non-zero. And that guarantees the momentum conservation as it should. So if we plot the momentum over here, you notice that momentum completely stays the same as it should. Obviously, that's the case. So this proves that this system has complete characteristics of everything is consistent, and we can have this. And when we look at going back and forth, we get the same thing there. 
And uh, so we decided to study with the dipole inside of this. So with the dipole inside such medium, and we have permittivity positive, and we bring it to negative and hold it, the wave of the dipole freezes and grows. And then you can let it go and propagate again. So this, this is the distribution of half over here. So one of the possible implementation is by the transmission line. Because a negative capacitor is a very well-known concept in circuit designer. I mean, uh, and as a result, we can imagine that you can actually bring a negative capacitor in parallel with this and connect this at the time you want, make the epsilon negative and the field grows. And indeed, these are the simulations that we have there. As I mentioned just before the pandemic, we actually had this design with my colleague and in his lab, he actually built it and we were just collecting the data. There was some instability they were trying to, to resolve and the pandemic happened and the lab closed down and that experiment goes on the shelf. So we are hoping that we can resurrect that. But in the meantime, we find you know, other interesting theoretical results. So let me stop over here. Oh, let me stop over here. This was another topic, but the, there's no time. So let me just go over the summary slide. So uh, oh, actually, let me. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, members and collaborators of my group that uh, significantly contributed to what I presented over here. I'm very thankful to them. They, they've done a great job. And uh, I want to thank all of you, by the way, for the uh, invitation to be here and for your interest. And uh, this talk, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about any question you have and the other projects that related to this. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. So I'm sure we have plenty of questions, but please wait uh, before asking a question until we get microphone for some people listening um, online. So please, questions. Um, so I was wondering, so we talk about some of these effects that happen in like an instantaneous switch of mm. permittivity or something like that. Is there like a... Um, Kind of a time scale considered where these effects are more likely to happen. So, like, is it is this only occurring in instantaneous switches? Is it like if it's significantly smaller than the time period of a wave, or, or is there like kind of a almost a decay of these effects as the transition time gets longer? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me explain. Uh, depending on what you want to get out of this phenomena, the answer to that question could be different. So, let me split it in two parts. If with the phenomena you are interested in changing the frequency, for example, for the modulation that I've mentioned, then what you need to do is to change the permittivity, not necessarily very fast, as long as the wave is still in your system. That's one of the reasons we looked at the ring resonator, precisely for that reason. Because while the wave is inside your structure, you can change uh, the permittivity, it doesn't have to be fast. In fact, if you do it slowly, and we, we have analysis of that, and I'd be happy to send you the paper on that one, that we look at the dispersion and we look at the variation of permittivity with a different rate. And actually, also in the paper of, by Andra and Emmanuel, they have also studied you know, the temporal transition as well for the different cases. It turns out that if you do that, eventually your frequency will change to what you want. In other words, going from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, and the frequency relates to epsilon 2. But what you get by making this slow is that backward wave almost disappears. And by the way, that's also an analogous to the temporal, uh, to the spatial case. If I have a boundary over here and I send the wave to that boundary, part of the wave gets to the other medium, part of it reflects back. But if you make that boundary adiabatic variation from this medium to that medium, reflected wave almost non-zero, but eventually your wave gets to that medium. So if you care about only frequency variation, as long as during the transition, the wave's still in your medium, you can do it. You don't have to have it rapid. Now, let's go to the second part of that. If in your analysis or your application, you need to have a backward wave, there are some applications that the backward wave is needed. In that case, you have to do it rapidly, and by rapidly means the fraction of the, of the, of the period of your monochromatic signal. So that's why it's mostly doable in microwave, at least so far. That's the thing. And that's one of the reason, by the way, we were looking also at the circuitry. But the main reason we were looking at the circuitry because we wanted to do non-faster one. Uh, and but Andrew Alou's group has done a beautiful job, by the way, looking at some of the experiments in the transmission line 
and they have the paper on the archive. You can take a look at what they have done with the, with the switches, with the structures. So yes, depending on the application you want, that, that variation can matter. Thank you, Nair, for the fantastic talk, as, as always. Thank you. So all your time variations are, let's say, instantaneous in that. So it's like a boundary that is normal to time. But you could, of course, slant that boundary yeah. of moving boundaries. And yeah. then this complicates things even further. I'm sure there could be many, many things. Absolutely. And uh, several groups are really working on that. Professor John Pendry is working on that. Ricardo, I think you are also working on that, if I'm not mistaken. It, Basically, the spatial temporal variation. Mario Silverino is working on that. So effectively, that becomes spatial temp temporal variation of permittivity. And it could be, for example, if there's a rapid one, it could be the boundary. It's like a moving boundary. That, yeah, and that can that can be done. And that has, of course, other interesting features. Yes. First thing to say is my head hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for. Fantastic talk. I'm Thank thinking you. about implementation as well and um, trying to see if I can think of anything where you could do this kind of uh, adopt this kind of approach in, in the optical domain. Um, and it seems that if we if we meet the, the criteria of trying to make the adjustment in Ipswich really fast on the time scale of an optical cycle, then yep. okay, we have femtosecond lasers. So that in principle looks like it, mm -hmm. it might do the job. And then when we're thinking about looking uh, at making a system that's got gain in it, then it seems like maybe one could pump something like an optical amplifier fast enough that you could actually drive it and it would stay hopefully in that state because the time scale for the whether there's still gain there's going to be the excited state lifetime, not the not something to do with the driving is so I'm just wondering if you've thought about trying sure, to move into sure. optical. Yes, that, yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, in the optical regime, that's much more challenging for uh, particularly if again, coming back to your question, if the goal is to actually get some backward weight in some application, you need that. In that case, you have to do it fast. Uh, some ideas that come to my mind is exactly about what you said, using nonlinearity, nonlinearity fast. You can do that, uh, particularly uh, kind of in the form of, you know, chi to nonlinearity in a sense that the, uh, that you can actually have the delta n being also becoming positive and negative, depending you know, on a polarity of the electric field. Uh, that's one aspect that you know, one can think of uh, to do that. After all, uh, is, uh, if, if we, uh, for example, wavelength conversion, Alan Wilner at USC has shown that actually experimentally, that you can actually have a metal surface that you send the pump through this it can actually change the wavelength of the of the signal, and that's based on the variation of delta n. One of the interesting aspects in these days that uh, some groups have done experimentally is using the epsilon near zero uh, materials that uh, we have worked on for many years. Because the epsilon, the real part of epsilon, linear part of epsilon is near zero, so the delta n that comes over here become more noticeable compared to the linear term. So uh, some work uh, been done in that direction. Uh, Vlad Shalayev and Daniele Faccio, you know, have done some work with Sasha Boltuseva. Uh, I think Modi Segev has, is doing or some, has done some work in that regard. So I think, yes, the, the, to your answer, nonlinearity will be the solution to that. Now, how fast would that be compared to the signal? That remains to be seen. The losses, you know, all of those things there. But yes, I can foresee that that would be a direction to go in that regard, if one wants to do it in the visible or near IR. Great. Oh, it's very interesting discussion as well. Um, my question is about, again, the same, uh, how can we have epsilon going negative? So you oh, showed us that- non faster one. Yes. Okay. okay. So you show that uh, by purely pushing the carrier, increasing the carrier concentration would not be enough. No. no. Uh, so you for the passive medium, we cannot do that. Yeah. But then in your mind, the active medium means that we are adding carrier to the material. No. Uh, what I mean, the, the things that come to my mind right now, that's one of the reasons I stick to the transmission line, because of negative capacitors are available. And negative capacitor is essentially capacitor connected to the amplifier. Exactly. But for light, I'm, I'm thinking about optical. I understand. I understand. <laughs> uh, I understand. 
can do that. I understand. That's right. Uh, one idea that we have, in, uh, we are at the very early stage of that, so we don't know how, how that will, will end up with, is to see whether we can actually combine a nonlinearity of chi2, and I'd be happy to talk to you offline, nonlinearity with two omega pump and one omega signal. And with the proper, I mean, phasing between them or zero crossing between them. We, we have some preliminary calculation of that remains to be seen, but even that is challenging because of course you require a very high intensity pump because chi2 is also still very small. So you need to have to bring it to the point there. Uh, so far, that, that, that's what I, I come to my mind. If you want to have a material to have it epsilon negative as non faster, because again, you have to you have to bring the energy from outside. You cannot do it with the passive medium. But I'd be happy to talk to you offline about that. Thank you very much. It's a very preliminary stage. Okay, great. So if we have one last question. No, not here, not online. No. <laughs> then um, that thanks Nade once again for fantastic lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I think it's fantastic. You can see what we can do with Maxwell equation in a lecture theater where allegedly Maxwell taught. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Anatoly. Thanks to all of you. And thank you. And thank you very much, Megan. Megan, thank you. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>